Um, my interest here is um, looking at new technologies and what we can do to uh, solve uh, social problems with it. Start out looking at water uh, conservation and technologies and that kind of got me into drones and studying how water affects agriculture and what we can do to make it better. So uh, I have a background in computers and computer science and databases and, and flying so that got me into drones. So I'm not an, a farmer per se or grower. I have uh, some backgrounds in it. But what I thought I'd do is just uh, let you know a little bit about what I'm doing now. It's a commercial service to provide drone service to San Diego farmers uh, and also in the Central Valley. I thought I'd just kind of walk through a survey and show you what a uh, drone can see by flying over a field and, um, and how that works. How many have seen the YouTube where the farmer goes out and throws up a, an airplane and comes back and he takes a card and he puts it in a computer and the next day he's uh, fertilizing his field with the precision fertilizer. Oh, you've seen that? Well, it's it's fiction. Uh, uh, the drones don't always come back, and you don't just throw a thirty thousand dollar gadget up in the air and hope that it comes back. Um, maybe it will, but uh, it's it's a lot more complicated. Um, but anyway, a survey uh, is um, this is all done on Google Maps uh, or uh, an iPad. Basically, you tap the the edges and the computer calculates the flight path and this green line is the flight that the drone takes and uh, it comes back if it needs batteries or you can move around and it generates um, in this case 860 images so it takes 860 pictures overlapping so that it can do a, a two-dimensional map like you see with Google Maps but it could also do a three-dimensional map uh, as you see with um, um, uh, Google Earth, so you can, uh, I'll show you some of that imaging also. Uh, so it can take pictures, one pixel on the camera is about one inch on the ground, that's called ground scale dimension, and it can calculate, because it has so many images overlooking each other, it can calculate the elevation of your crop or your land or your building or whatever, down to about a four inch resolution. So it can see four inches vertical and one inches, uh, uh, one inch horizontally, uh, per pixel as you get on the image. And for this survey, um, I come up with uh, over uh, one billion pixels. So it's a gigapixel image. So this is all stitched together. And uh, I'm currently flying in both visible and uh, near infrared cameras so that I can do uh, other tricks here. I'll show you. So the zoomable um, two dimensional map, this is the Milano Fields, by the way. Um, there are flower growers in Oceanside. Uh, this is about a 350 acre uh, ranch that they have. And this is the pattern of the thing. So I'm flying the whole, whole ranch for them. And then each map, uh, it comes out as one picture, but then you can zoom in. So you have the overall picture, and then just like you can with Google Maps, you can get in smaller, and then you get even smaller. So the entire ranch is mapped on a monthly basis, and they can go through and find out exactly what's going on and, and see their fields. So that's uh, one of my things, is this chronological look at your f fields and understanding how things are flowing over time. And these are layers that can be uh, established. So you say, well, what happened last uh, Ju July? What happened now and then? So the crop health report is a, a version of looking at the health of the field um, by comparing the red and the uh, green, the theory for this, and this is all done through visual uh, cameras, the camera shoots in red, green, and blue uh, sensitive uh, light uh, areas, and it's taking the red, the theory is that the red is the plant uh, radiating heat when it's doing photosynthesis, and the red and green, or the green and blue, is where the plant is absorbing light for photosynthesis. So we'll talk about the photosynthetic, photosynthesis active region of the spectrum, which is where it's absorbing to give you the green, but the plant cools itself by radiating any infrared, near infrared uh, things that you can't see, but it's the same you'd see on your television remote, but that's the near infrared light there. So in this particular report, we can see the, the green color is the healthier uh, crop, and you see over here it's, it's obviously unhealthy. Um, but you can also see some outlines of, of various uh, shapes here. And when you start looking at your fields from above, you can see things that you can't see necessarily by walking them. 
And this is one of the things that Mike Milano found when he was looking at his fields, is that uh, you can see, see things earlier from the air. Uh, so this, this is good for looking at consistency. You can find out uh, uh, in, uh, imperfections in your irrigation and things like that. This chart down here allows you to move these sliders back and forth. And you can say, what percentage of my field is in this green region? And what percentage is red? And uh, so you get a, a feel for your overall crop health. So that's the uh, crop health report. report. Digital elevation map looks at the elevation of, of what it sees. And that's the, um, uh, could be used for crop height uh, analysis and things like that. So on the left side, this, this uh, red is the higher part and the blue is the lower parts of the field. So this is just colored. And then again, you can zoom in the same way as before. It's about one fourth the resolution as the um, photo uh, level. But then you can draw a line. So I, I think you can see this blue line here from here to here. I just picked this area and drew a line. And then the computer tells me the elevation uh, of that, uh, uh, that cross section that I drew. Uh, this is marked off in, in feet below the takeoff point. So we we're on a slope. I took off at a higher level, and, and this is a lower level. But uh, you can see that the crop uh, row height here is, is uh, this height, and then it comes back over here. So this is the road uh, area between the, the rows. And then you can see this kind of varies here. And uh, so that would allow you to do crop height analysis, and I'll show you later, I've done that for some forestry analysis to measure the height of trees. So this gives you a three-dimensional map of, of, the, of your field. Um, uh, three-dimensional visualization. Um, are we connected to the internet, do you know, Taylor? You think so? Um, so this, this actually generates a virtual reality thing. It's something you might see in Google. I'm gonna, no, it's not working. I'm sorry, I can't get offline here. I probably followed up my PowerPoint too. Um, but this would allow you to uh, 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 zoom around and pick up the, the, the field from lots of different angles. You could see the sun angles. You could see what buildings, shadows, and things like that. You could zoom in and out and twirl this around. Uh, this is not what's called geo-referenced. It's, it's just floating in space so that you can uh, twirl it around. If you had uh, Google Glasses, you could see it in, in three dimensions, and your, your kids would go crazy being able to see a farm like it's a video game. Um, but anyway, it's just one of the visualizations that you can do there. Uh, another uh, application is volumetric analysis, so that uh, you can pick up uh, an object. So this is just a, a pile I found oh, last July, um, and it was 35 yards of stuff. I don't know what it is, but... Um, so you go over here, uh, can you see my mouse cursor? Can you see what I'm pointing at? So you just tap the edges of the surface that you want and it will calculate the volume of the, the pile or the material above the ground. So if you want to see how much mulch you have or gravel or if you have erosion damage after a, a, a flood or something like that, but it just allows you to see the, your, your field. So if you're using fertilizer, uh, or something like that, um, you can do that. So that's called volumetric analysis, and uh, that's just another way of looking at the same survey. So I'm showing you one flight being used in many different ways. So you can also do area management. So this picture, measurement, so this picture is looking at some uh, plastic covering on uh, the crops, and there's this hole here that you can barely see, so you zoom into the hole, and you tap the edges of it, and it comes out and tells you how many square feet of plastic that are damaged. Um, so that's any, anything on the field you want to measure, you can measure it that way. You can measure uh, um, you know, damage, you can measure size of fields, the, the estimate size of crops. Another one I call it a to-do list, but you see something like that, and you can sit there. I think somebody asked me if they could sit at their desk and monitor their farm. And I said, why do you have to sit at your desk? Why can't you be in Hawaii? And uh, he said he liked the way I thought. But, um, but anyway, uh, you can do a to-do list. Uh, you could, this comes up with an exact uh, latitude and longitude that could be fed into a geographical information system and say, here's something that needs to be done. Um, and you can even uh, come up with a specific image. 
and uh, then you can uh, start talking about your field at this visual level. And uh, so that, that takes this data and puts it into a geographical information system, which I'll talk about later. Um, a capacity of a pond. In the Milanos, they have to capture water uh, runoff of, for a half inch of rain, so they need to know how much they have. So this is a negative volume, basically. So I just went around the pond and tapped the edges. Okay. Uh, tapped the edges of the pond, and it tells me that there's 57 cubic yards of water uh, available in the pond at uh, that calculation. Uh, unfortunately, it counts the trees as um, uh, area above the pond and so it, it can't see that the tree is something that does that so there's it's, it's not perfect actually none of these perfect none of these measurements are perfect to the point of what a surveyor would give you and I've had surveyors get down on me saying you're not doing a survey you have to be a civil engineer with a pole and okay I'm not doing civil engineering levels of surveys so um, but as far as estimating how much mulch you have in the field or something like that, um, it's probably accurate to the nearest yard or two, I don't know, but everything has to be taken uh, with a grain of salt. But uh, this gives them a, a, an idea of, of the capacity of the pond they're working with and uh, how, much how much water uh, it could be in there. And uh, uh, Okay, there's technology called NDVI, Normalized Difference Vegetation Index it comes out of NASA when they were flying satellites and trying to figure out how much vegetation there is in the Amazon or whatever. And what they did is they looked at the photosynthetically active region of the spectrum. The, 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 what, uh, I, did, I left my chart off there, but it's the, the, the visible parts of the spectrum that the plant uses to do uh, photosynthesis with and the chlorophyll does its thing. The near-infrared is uh, a different part of the spectrum, which is the cooling part of the plant and the NDVI measures the near infrared and the PAR photosynthetic, photosynthetically active region and measures those and, and does the calculation between them and comes up with an index which is the near infrared minus the visible divided by the near infrared plus the visible. So that index then tells the uh, computer and you display this to see the plant health and supposedly the photosynthetic uh, um, activities. So this is a very mathematically inclined number, all kinds of exciting things there, and what could possibly go wrong? Well, it might not work right. Um, you can get a lot of pretty pictures and false colored images. What they really mean is uh, to be determined. But uh, anyway, that's a, a very popular aspect of uh, the drone use. and. Uh, I do it, I can show you what it does here. So this is, I'm comparing uh, what the, the image looks like in the near infrared, that's this, this pinkish color here. And that's through a very special filter. And it's actually measuring the, the near infrared and the um, uh, reddish magenta color. And then it processes that and it comes up with this NDVI image over here. So the top here is healthier than down here and you can see uh, this area here has done this. So that's the um, uh, NDVI analysis of the field. So this will tell you uh, a level of crop health. Um, it's fairly uh, crisp and, and well defined. Uh, you can see things that are kind of happening kind of funny over here. If you look at it, it looks kind of mottled. If you look at this, it's very green and bushy and, and smooth. smooth um, colors. So this is their flower fields with the NDVI uh, management. Uh, this is the visible light. So this is what it looks in visible art, red, green, and blue uh, lighting. And uh, I'll learn how my computer works here. And uh, you can see the, the, the crops here. Now the, this all could be zoomed into arbitrarily deeply so you can uh, get this down to an inch per pixel resolution. So this is that crop health uh, thing that I showed you before. So it's a different false color uh, view. Um, I also fly with a calibration target. So before I, I take off, I put a target on the ground and I take a picture of it in the current sunlight. So I get, and that has infrared targets on it, very carefully cal uh, calibrated. So I can calibrate the images to the target, fly the flight, come back, and in the computer, um, take the near-infrared images, uh, put them into the uh, computer, recalibrate them according to what the flight saw, 
and then recalculate the NDVI uh, image over here. Now one of the things I found with uh, the Milano fields is that uh, it doesn't always, green doesn't always mean healthier. So we've got some myrtle fields next to some uh, eucalyptus and the myrtle looks really green and the eucalyptus looks dead. Well, eucalyptus is a silvery color and it's not the same green as myrtle. So somehow, <coughs> if you use this, you have to come up with the uh, 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 understanding what's going on, probably on a crop by crop basis. And uh, that's one of my interest areas is really getting to understand the crops and how they look on these uh, uh, images. Another really exciting thing is thermal in imaging, and that's in the infrared deeper in the spectrum, and that's actually measuring the temperature of the crop or the leaf or the uh, canopy. And so this, you've seen the little uh, uh, infrared uh, uh, thermometers you can get for 30 bucks. That's just a single pixel, uh, but you can measure this, the, the temperature of the roof with uh, uh, that guy. So with the thermal imaging, it's like uh, 3,000 of those uh, pixels uh, all at once, and you can see uh, the color of things. So you see a, a color picture, a picture by color. So this is an example, again, of the Milano fields of myrtle. Uh, this is the row between the plants. This is a healthy row, this kind of magenta color. And suddenly you see this yellow appearing over here again. And this turned out to be a spider mite uh, infestation, uh, I, I think. Uh, but this shows the, a little bit of, uh, of, of yellow, which means, means the uh, plants are warmer, which means they're not doing evapotranspiration. So by looking at the temperature of the crop, you can see their, their health levels. And uh, so that's thermal imaging. And uh, this is, would also be great for uh, cattle, uh, counting cattle and, and uh, farms for measuring animals. Um, search and rescue type activities, any, anytime you want to uh, see a temperature difference on the ground. But in general, the healthier the plant is, the cooler the leaves are because of through the evapotranspiration. So this was cool. The other thing that uh, Mike Milano Sr. Uh, detected on these myrtle fields uh, was the this spider mite infestation. He, he saw a difference in the texture of the field, just in the visible level in December and in February they diagnosed as a spider mite uh, uh, to be sprayed. But he saw it from the air two months before he saw it from the ground. So um, he was pretty excited about having that uh, kind of lead time on detecting this. So it's a tool, I mean, uh, it's not something that is uh, absolute. We don't give you a number that says your crop is 42% healthy. I, I guess I could generate that for you if you want. I don't know what it would mean, but it's, it's a matter of giving you another tool for seeing your fields in a whole new light. And uh, so um, it's very fast moving technology. Um, and another area is turf management, golf courses that I'm looking at and water conservation here. So this is a golf course and uh, they're looking at the efficiency of their sprinkler system and you can see, see what they look like right now. Uh, I've talked to a, a turf consultant and he said the first thing he does with the golf course is he goes in and turns the water down 10% and doesn't tell anybody and just their water bill goes down and they don't notice any difference but he says it's pretty universal that people over water. Um, I don't know if we have any golf course people here or turf people but um, this gives you positive feedback as to what's what's actually happening. But again, for the, the evenness and seeing things from above rather than walking the golf course or driving through with your golf cart, you get a better picture of it and you see the geometry. Um, you might see uh, gradations on, on elevation, it might be a fertilizer thing, it might be a soil thing, but you can see large scale uh, changes in your uh, crop. Uh, I flew this at uh, Mineral King in the Sequoia National Forest area. Uh, drones are not allowed in the National Forest. Uh, Mineral King is a little enclave that's not National Forest. I got approval with the National Forest people say, fine, you can fly you want, but try to stay away from the forest trees. But I was looking at bark beetle damage, and it's uh, hard to see that here. Uh, actually, on all these pictures here, but uh, the center point here is a damaged tree. So I went through and I measured the height of the tree with the, uh, that tool that I showed you earlier. And this is like 180 foot tree. And then I drew a 180 foot radius circle there. And these are the cabins that are threatened by that dead tree for Silver City. 
So you can go through and, and do this analysis um, all at your desktop. And, you know, it'd be nice to tromp, tromp through there, but you have 120 acres they have to worry about. And uh, uh, so you can see the trees, you can count them. Um, bark beetle damage goes very quickly and you can do an inventory uh, very quickly. <coughs> and uh, then you can see which are the most uh, dangerous trees to worry about for removal. So drones always give you this gee whiz thing. I thought about bringing my drone and flying it and everybody be a gee whiz, but um, first of all, I'm not sure that fairgrounds would let, let me. Um, the technology is amazing. Uh, it's a convergence of, of, of battery power, of computers, of GPS, of visualization, mass production, sh shrinking technologies. Uh, it's, it's amazing uh, technology and it's just gonna get better. Uh, if you've seen the, the uh, um, SpaceX rocket land on the barge, that is an amazing thing to, if somebody asked me if you could do that 20 years ago, I said, no way, not possible. But that same kind of control system that allows you to land the rocket vertically on a barge or drive a car autonomously is also what's driving uh, the drone automation. I fly almost all my flights through the computer, I plan them at home, I, I get all of my everything ready at home and I look at it and study the flight and uh, then I go out to the field I press the go button and, and hopefully it just comes back when it's done um, but the uh, autonomy is really powerful and it's just going to get more and more uh, powerful um, I come back with four or five gigabytes of data from the Milano fields and it takes six eight hours sometimes twelve hours to to crunch it all uh, can generate an incredible amount of data. And Mike Anthony, as he said, is, you know, I have a lot of data already. I'm not really sure I need more. I need more relevant data. And so the question is, how do you take all of this data and, and make it relevant? And so you can go to Walmart and buy a drone and fly it and get lots and lots of pictures, but what are you going to do with it? So the data management is called uh, GIS, Geographical Information Systems, um, I think are a big area, and that's an area that I'm planning to put a lot of energy into. And if you look at Google Maps, uh, you say, you know, find me the nearest coffee. Um, it just tells you, go here to go get the coffee over there. Uh, it, there's an incredible amount of other information that you're not seeing that's not relevant. And you don't have to wade through it. You don't need to look through the coffee spreadsheet to find the, the Starbucks and then do that. So it's this geographically uh, mapped thing, and it only shows you the layers of information that you need. So that, I think, is, is key to farm management, is, is being able to see your farm in this geographical uh, model, which GIS technology does for you. And it's kind of like the Google Maps. It just shows you what you want to know. If I want to look at crop productivity, if I want to look at um, water usage, I want to look at fertilizer, or uh, whatever, uh, you have these layers. So I think, uh, to me, that's the, the, the next stage of what needs to be done, is integrating all this information into something that makes sense. Uh, particularly in water management, water conservation. Um, how many people actually sub-meter their water uh, when they water? I mean, you know per, per field how much water you put in there? Okay, great. Um, I, I, I haven't seen that everywhere I've gone, so congratulations. You're obviously very smart farmers. Uh, but, um, so you could couple that with the, the drone images, and so you could show what the effects of the flight of the water is to this, and maybe you can turn your water down or up, but it allows you to measure it. So that's called the Internet of Things. Uh, all of your water connectivity, electrical connectivity, and uh, soil moisture and everything like that, you can put in there too. So obviously you're measuring it and you can manage it. Uh, the ground truth feedback, that's another area that I'm interested in. Uh, my nephew and brother have a laboratory up in Lodi and they've been doing soil surveys, so they're my Central Valley office when we're working together. And um, the ground truth, so you see something up here, what does it look like down there? What, what actually is happening? And so that's uh, understanding what, what it looks like to what, what you, you see. So that ground truth I think is important and uh, looking at uh, better ways of, of uh, doing your precision agriculture with that feedback. 4D integration is called, but a time lapse. Um, you don't usually see the world as a time lapse. It's uh, just a snapshot. You look at something, but how has this changed over time? Um, and um, the Milano fields, if I were online, I could show you, but uh, they can just go through and click on 
uh, July's or August or September or uh, November data and just see these layers pop up and go away and they could zoom in and see a, a, a single field and see what it looked like over time. So the sense of understanding the flow of things over time as opposed to just snapshots. Uh, smarter understanding, um, uh, again, there's a lot of stuff to look at and the question is how do you make something that's uh, 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 relevant and eucalyptus versus myrtle and uh, so when you do do that and you learn your specific crops when they're flowering uh, maybe you want to do inventory of, of how many pots you have in the nursery or whatever but um, there's a lot of things that are very specific to the individual crop and, and nursery situation uh, so there's tools that are, are already available so you, you can count co uh, corn and soy seedlings from the air uh, but that's uh, Midwest where you've got 5,000 acres of the corn and it flies down there and tells you how many plants have sprouted. But to uh, look at a nursery and see all the uh, bird of paradise plants, particularly if they're kind of into a canopy situation, uh, can be hard to see from the air. Anyway, so basically the whole idea is uh, smarter farmers to uh, help their, uh, see their crops in a whole new light. Uh, FAA is involved. We've had a lot of help with uh, California and uh, federal regulations on how farmers are going to get water, and I'm sure you know have lots of regulations with your farm. FAA has uh, just changed regulations as of August. Uh, they'll change again soon. Uh, there's, it's a very dynamic area. Uh, they're called Unmanned Aerial Systems, UAS. Uh, the FAA Part 107 is the new regulation. You no longer have to be a licensed pilot to do this, but you have to have a remote pilot's license, basically, which is a separate test and a separate acceptance procedure and a separate um, a set of responsibilities. Um, but anybody who is flying agriculture is supposed to fly under Part 107 pilots. So uh, it's a 600-page it's a uh, uh, set of regulations that you need to understand, and uh, you have to pass that test to be a, a licensed pilot to, to fly this way. Um, the regulations are probably going to get changed. Uh, there are also ways of getting exemptions for certain things. Uh, people who fly these uh, fixed wing flights in the Midwest for an hour's worth of flying over 5,000 acres, the, the plane is going outside of their visual line of reference, and that's officially not kosher with the FAA. Um, but what the FAA says is kosher and what people do are sometimes in a disagreement. Uh, I want to thank people. Um, Mike Milano Sr. on the left here. My father is Don Monike, who was a professor at UC Riverside in plant pathology and uh, was his senior professor, at, uh, Mike's senior professor in plant path for his PhD. And Michael A. Uh, Milano also got his PhD from UCR under a different professor. But they've been a wonderful group to work with. Um, very innovative and very happy to look at new technologies and uh, it's been a wonderful experience working with them and I hope to continue that. And I'm happy to work with other people that want to uh, get involved in this. Um, I'd love to get into some experimental stuff of trying new things and seeing if we can, uh, what we can see there. I'm very amenable to just uh, doing some short-term project with you or long-term uh, chronological mapping. So that's me. Um, uh, my company here is at Monikey Enterprises, and uh, Jeff Monikey, my nephew, is up in the Central Valley, and they have a laboratory, and uh, we'll be working out of the Central Valley, uh, looking at what we can do there. Um, and uh, they've been doing soil surveys for the oil industry for 20 years now, and they want to uh, move into other agricultural stuff. We're thinking about specializing in specific crops, such as grapes or, or whatever. But um, very happy to work with you in any way. Uh, we need smart growers to work with, or some growers that want to get smarter, and uh, I'm the technologist and the, uh, uh, the geek behind it all, but uh, I need people with agronomy experts, and world, uh, consultants and like that are also partners we're looking for. So that's where it stands right now. Um, do we have any questions? Uh, you raised your hand first. Uh, I use a little bit of drone deploy and a little maps made easy. Uh, I have a love affair, hate affair with both of them. And uh, are you flying right now? Yeah, I haven't gone online yet, but I, I fly, yes. Yeah. Um, how many drones have you lost? Well, the second time I took it out, I flew it into a palm tree. 
Okay. Since then, I've been okay. Uh, it, everybody asks, for, you know, they want to fly it themselves, and they have a grandkid that wants to fly them, and they see the controller and they think it's fun. It is fun. Um, actually, making it productive and making your time to do that more productive than what you should be doing is another issue. But uh, if you're going to get a drone, get a cheap one and crash a cheap one, not an expensive one. Um, so I, I'm under my third crash. Well, I've crashed two. I'm waiting for my third. But uh, they, they, it's very early in the whole uh, technology. Uh, I can blame the manufacturer for all of my crashes. It's, it's not my fault. But uh, the, the drones themselves are, uh, they generate a lot of data. The problem is, what do you do with the data when you get it? And, so you can you can go out and Walmart today buy a drone, come back with uh, 10 gigabytes of data. So more power to it. We had another question over here. Yeah. Have you used it over avocado drones? Oh uh, yes, I did. Uh, Susan Estrada, she's not here uh, in San Marcos. I just did her grove a couple weeks ago. Um, it was very hilly. Um, she was trying to. Well, her ultimate goal, she wanted to see the the fruit. Um, it's pretty hard to see the fruit from a canopy. And we don't have x-ray vision for fruit yet. Uh, we're talking to this guy at the crop. He's got some kind of uh, sunlight reflectance uh, 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 protection system that uh, he wanted to measure how much it actually reduced. But no, avocado, the growth as far as doing the NDVI and, and looking at the health of the, the leaves, um, you can do that very easily, I think. Um, slopes. Um, can be a problem. It, it's just more challenging to keep from flying into the, the slope. Um, but typically, um, I would imagine that you don't need a lot of resolution. You don't need to see individual leaves so much as the, the whole canopy. Um, I suspect this thermal IR, the, the one that I showed you, the spider mite, might be the most effective thing to tell you your uh, crop health. Um, um, I haven't. I haven't bought that yet. It's a fifteen thousand dollar gadget, and I haven't found a customer willing to pay me f for the service. I'd love to find one. I think it would make a lot of difference. But um, and remember, though, those things can crash too. So you can crash a fifteen thousand dollar camera as well as a, a four hundred dollar Kmart special. But anyway, yeah, avocados would be great. Um, I would like to see what we can do with water stress and, and reduction. Um, and uh, happy to talk to you about it. I'd love to fly that. Uh, another question? Do we have two over there? He actually asked the same question. Oh, okay. <laughs> Any other uh, questions here? Oh, one of the other things I'm looking at is actual pesticide application. Um, the people are flying uh, about two gallons, basically. FAA regulates uh, this type of license for an unmanned vehicle up to 55 pounds. So. Uh, 54.99, by the way, if you go through FAA test. But um, the, so the 55 pound limit gives you maybe a 15 to 20 pound set of batteries and aircraft, and then 30 pounds, 40 pounds, maybe if you're lucky, of, of water or uh, material. Uh, the benefit is you can be very, very high precision. So you could fly right over a single tree or a portion of a tree, dump six ounces, and go on. And, uh, the prop wash is very efficient for distributing it. Uh, also looked at um, pollinating almonds. Uh, so uh, to fly the pollen through an orchard and just blow the, the almond pollen uh, th through the orchard, so it's a fairly lightweight thing. But if you're doing 60 gallons an acre, uh, you're not going to do that with a drone. But if you have uh, um, specific areas that you want to just do uh, maybe a half an acre at a, a, a two gallons an acre uh, volume, you could do something like that. Um, <clears throat> so I'm, I'm, I don't have the gear to do that. I'm happy to explore it with people. But um, it's fairly expensive stuff. And I don't know about all the FAA regulations on it right now. I, I suspect they're going to be happy to regulate it heavily. I'm sure that all the, the, the standard pesticide stuff that, uh, you know, that you're already dealing with is applied there. But um, so that's another area of, of um, activity there. So, any other questions? Ah, oh, yes, sir. I, I'm sorry. Say again. What is the cost of what you do? I mean, like survey. What is the cost of what I do? Oh, the cost of the survey? Um, well, it's custom right now. Um, 
I don't have a per acre uh, cost. It, it has to do with uh, where it is physically and whether it's on a slope and whether you want uh, infrared or, uh, or visual. Um, and how many acres it is and what airspace it's in, if it's near an airport that I need to do extra stuff there. Um, so I'm not, I'm not giving out a specific price per, per acre right now. I'm certainly happy to talk to you and, and hear what, what your situation is. If you're right next to the Milanos, it would probably be cheaper because I'm, I'm up there all the time. Uh, but the, uh, having a, a, a route that I could do the North River area and San Luis Rey Valley or whatever would, would certainly uh, make it a lot easier to, to do a lot in a short time. Uh, and also it has to do with the number of acres and uh, how much computer time. There's the, one of the big costs is the computer time and uh, depending on the service that you use that uh, presents it, there might be a fixed monthly fee or, or a per, per survey fee. But um, I'll be glad to talk to you and do a test flight for you and something like that and we'll just sit, take a look at it. So. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, appreciate you spending your late afternoon nap with uh, here instead of uh, wherever you're going to rest.